continue walking through the book of Acts and come this morning to the end of Acts, we're looking at chapter 7, verses 54 to 60. If you have your Bible with you, please turn there in Acts chapter 7. If you're using a few Bible, you can find this on page 916. Now, before we read God's word and hear it preach to us, let's go to our Lord and ask you to enlighten our hearts and minds and we might rightfully receive that which he has for us. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you this morning thanking you and praising you that you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your word, Lord. We understand that you use the preaching of your word to convict and convert, to build up and to edify. So Lord, I ask you to accomplish your purposes this morning. As we consider this text of scripture, Lord, help us to see what it looks like to be one dying with dignity. Help us, Lord, to see our need to show everyone Jesus. So Lord, I ask you to be with me as your servant. Let the words I speak be the words you placed in my mouth for turning of hearts to yourself, for building up your people, and bringing glory to your name. And Lord, I ask you to be with each one here this morning who's hearing your word preached, Lord. Help each one to be an active listener, Lord, to hear the words you speak, and through it, Lord, grow them in their faith. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. So Acts chapter 7, beginning of verse 54. Hear now God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. In June of 1997, the United States Supreme Court decided that physician-assisted suicide was not unconstitutional. Since then, seven states have passed laws that say doctors can help their patients die. And the thought behind these laws is compassion and concern. They say people are suffering and struggling. They're in great pain. So what can we do to help them? And the thought is this. How can we help them to die with dignity? But the question becomes, is taking your life really a dignified thing to do? Or is it simply a hopeless solution to a very real and difficult problem? See, wherever you stand with physician-assisted suicide, you're going to have to face this question one day, because I'm sorry to tell you, one day you're all going to die. And the question will come, when that day comes, Will you be one who's dying with dignity? See, that's what we see in our text this morning. Stephen is an example of one who's dying with dignity. I want you to follow along on our way to the big idea. We're going to make four stops along the way. You're going to see first, the truth hurts. Second, look heavenly. Third, sin silences truth. And fourth, show them Jesus. And this is going to bring us to Stephen's point, which is the point of the message. Get this down. Dying with dignity means showing people Christ. So first, the truth hurts. You ever have somebody say something to you that you just didn't want to hear because it hurt too much? You're familiar with this, right? That's why they say the truth hurts. And you know what? That's why a lot of people don't want to hear the truth and a lot of people don't want to share the truth because they don't want to bring the pain that the truth often brings. Now listen, that's a very noble and worthwhile thing to do, to not try and cause needless pain to people. But do you realize some truths are so important to hear that it's no benefit or help to not share them? I you know one of those truths is the gospel truth. See, people need to understand that they're a sinner if they're going to come to understand their need for a savior. So think of the gospel truth this way, as a truth that not only hurts, but a truth that actually heals. 
and so it's a truth that you need to speak. See, that's what Stephen's doing in our text. Think about last week what he had just done. He just spoken the truth of the gospel to his captors, to this tribunal. What did he tell them? He said, you're sinners. He said, you've got uncircumcised hearts and ears. And what he found was just how much the truth hurts. Because this truth cut this tribunal to the bone. So they turned on him in great anger. They were enraged. Look what it says in verse 54. You see right here how the truth set his judges off. Verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. This language enraged more literally means they were furious in their hearts. This is the idea that Stephen's sharing of the truth hurt them right to their core of their being. It's cutting them to the heart. Think of it how people get enraged if you say something nasty about their mother or their spouse or their son. Think about what they say. Don't mess with a jealous man's wife or how they say, hell knows no fury like a woman scorned. This is capturing the fear and the anger and the hostility that Stephen himself is seeing right here. All because he spoke truthful words. And that's why verse 54 ends and says, and they ground their teeth at him. See, this language, ground their teeth at him, it's expressing the intense pain and hurt that these people felt. It's kind of like when you're sitting in a dentist chair and you're grinding your teeth like this, because it hurts so bad. That's the picture that's being painted for you right here. And what you're seeing is clearly how the truth hurts. And this is something that's crucial to hear because there's no doubt in my mind that some of you are so caring that you don't want to share the gospel because you don't want to cause the hurt that it brings. But again, ask yourself, how are you really helping anybody if you don't tell them that Jesus Christ died for their sins? See, don't just tell them they're a sinner. That just hurts. Add to it what Christ accomplished on the cross, how he died for their sins so they might be brought to saving life. See, that's how you take a truth that hurts and actually help it to heal. It's the idea of the truth spoken in love, showing what Christ came to accomplish. And it's only by people hearing the truth that they're brought to saving faith. You realize that? You can be as nice as you want to people, and guess what? They're not going to come to saving faith. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. And ask yourself this question. As hard as it is to hear the gospel truth, and as painful as it is, do you think it's more painful to spend an eternity in hell? See, that's what you're sparing people from by speaking the truth to them. So brothers and sisters, be willing to speak the truth, even though the truth hurts. And do this knowing that a hurtful truth can actually heal. Which brings us to our second point. Look heavenward. Stephen's sharing the truth because he actually wants to help his brothers, his Jewish brothers who are trying to persecute him here. He wants to move them away from their temple idolatry. He's seeking their good, but they don't see it that way. And you notice because of the violent way they respond to his words. Could you imagine being Stephen here? Have you ever been in this situation? Well, you're actually trying to help somebody. You actually care about them. So you have a tough conversation with them. And what happens? They get angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. That's what's going on here. So when that happens, doesn't that cause you to kind of turn your attention to them and think, well, how can I calm this down? How can I ease the situation? What can I do to make them feel better? See, I think that's what often we do. But notice Stephen doesn't. He doesn't look at his tribunal. He looks somewhere else. He does a different approach. He actually looks heavenward. Look at verse 55. Look what it says. But he, that is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. Because Stephen was looking heavenward and not in his circumstances, he got to see God's glory. What you're seeing right here is a special glimpse of God's divine revelation. He's giving Stephen a sneak peek, as it were, as to what awaits him, what he's headed towards. This language of being full of the Holy Spirit is showing just that, God's special divine revelation. It's just what God does with Moses 
back in Exodus 33, 18, when his glory passes before him, and Moses sees the glory of God. See, God reveals himself because he wants you to see his glory because that helps you. And you know how he does that today? Through his word. Pick up his Bible and read it and you'll see God's glory. Come to church and hear his word faithfully preached and you'll see God's glory. That's what he does. And you'll hear the truth because that's the truth you want to share with people. The truth that heals is the truth of the gospel. So let them know about their sin but also let them know how Christ is the answer, that there's healing to be found in the arms of Jesus Christ. See, that's the truth that heals and sets people free from their sin. So speak the truth in a way that points people heavenward. Let them see Jesus Christ and the glory that he brings. Because the truth no longer hurts when you see Jesus and how he heals your sin. And not only that, actually vindicates you, stands up for you. See, that's what's revealed to Stephen as he's gazing heavenward. What does he see? He sees Jesus Christ not sitting, but standing. This is the only time in Scripture, the only time Jesus Christ is standing in heaven. And you know why he's standing? Because he's serving as Stephen's advocate. He's vindicating him. If you ever go to court with me and I'm your defense counsel, you know what happens? I stand up to represent you. Timothy Ferguson representing the defendant. Well, Jesus Christ stands up in heaven and says, Jesus Christ for the defendant. Jesus Christ for the sinner. He stands to vindicate you. And that's what Stephen's seeing as he looks heavenward. And why does this happen? Because Jesus is reminding Stephen, just as he reminds you of what he does. Luke 12, 8 says this. Everyone who stands and confesses Christ before the world, Christ will stand and confess before his heavenly Father. See, that's what happens. And that's why you can confidently stand and share the truth if you're looking heavenward, seeing what awaits you, what beholds you, seeing how Christ stands to vindicate you. And that's what you see. That's why verse 55 ends. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is critically important to understand. Because think about the context again. Stephen's on trial for what? For blasphemy. For saying that Jesus Christ was God himself. And this is set the people off in a rage. And now what does Stephen do to top things off? He says, hey guys, I see Christ standing and vindicating me. He's saying I'm right. You think that's helping his defense any? No. This is setting him off more. But that's what Jesus is doing for Stephen. He's helping to see, I've got you in my hands. You're okay. You're protected. You're all right because I'm standing with you. And you see it because he's where? He's standing at the right hand of God. You see what the right hand is? The right hand is the seat of power. It's like when you say, he's my right hand man. That's somebody you intimately trust. Somebody you've got complete confidence in. A second in command, as it were. It's basically what we saw previously. It's Joseph with Pharaoh. Remember how Pharaoh made Joseph king over the land? He was his second in command, gave him all authority. Well, that's what Stephen is saying. He sees God doing with Jesus Christ, standing side by side with God. So Stephen's conveying that God and Jesus are one and the same. He's telling this tribunal, I'm not guilty of blasphemy because Jesus is God. You get that? And he's seeing Christ stand to vindicate him and say, yes, it's true. And you know this? Because Stephen uses Jesus Christ's favorite self-descriptor. The way that Jesus most often referred to himself in Scripture was with that designation, Son of Man. So what does Stephen say? Look at verse 56. What does he say here? Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So you see Jesus at the right hand, the seat of power, and yet you also see something critical and crucial. Did you pick up on it? If Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, what does that mean? That means he's still living. He's alive. This Jesus that he put to death on the cross, Stephen's saying, guess what? He lives today. That's your hope, that he lives today. He's not a dead Savior, but a live Lord. It's the fulfillment of Jesus Christ's own prophetic words spoken in Luke twenty-two sixty-nine. 
where he says at his own trial, but from now on, you'll see the Son of Man at the right hand of power of God. As promised, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God to come and judge the wicked, but also to intercede for you, to vindicate you. Isn't that good to know? That Jesus is in heaven speaking on your behalf? He's your defense counsel? That's what Stephen's laying out here. It's what's indicated by Stephen saying, Jesus is standing at the right hand, and he sees all this. Why? Because his focus is not on his persecutors, but he's looking heavenward. Stephen stands before this tribunal, and what does he see? Jesus Christ standing for him. And you know what? This is the same promise and hope each and every one of you has. If you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you confidently can know that one day Christ will be standing in heaven for you. When you stand before God for judgment, Christ will be standing up and saying, Jesus Christ for the defense. And he'll intercede for you. That's the hope you have. He'll be your advocate with his heavenly Father. And he'll vindicate you before all your worldly judges. And this is why you can faithfully stand and speak the truth that hurts, and you can do so by simply looking heavenward. So brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, look heavenward. And do this because not everyone will see things the way you do, which brings us to our third point. Sin silences truth. All too often, people don't see or understand the truth you speak. And it's not because it's too complicated, too difficult to comprehend. It's not because you're not smart enough or speak good enough. It's simply because, quite frankly, so often people just don't want to hear the truth. They seek to stop the truth by plugging their ears and closing their eyes. And that's what you see going on here as you see how sin silences truth. Look how this tribunal reacts to Stephen's truthful words. They don't hear the truth spoken. They don't hear how Jesus Christ came to save them from their sins, how he's the true temple. All they hear are words that condemn Stephen, words of condemnation. They're hearing that they're a sinner, and that sets them off, and they stop, and they hear no more. So they never get to hear how Jesus Christ died to save them from their sins. They stop listening, so they never get to hear that. And that makes them lose their minds. It's sort of like when you're trying to speak to somebody truthfully about sin and consequences and what it does. And what do they do? Doesn't it set them off in a rage? If you doubt that, I'll give you, I'll give you a little practice run you can do. Go to a pro-abortion rally and tell the people there that life begins at conception. Or go to a pro-homosexual march and tell them that God's word says marriage is between one man and one woman. Or go to one of these very loving and peaceful ecumenical council gatherings and say the scripture says there's just one true living God and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Do that and see how people fly into a rage when they hear that type of truth. You're going to suddenly see how loving, peaceful people can turn into a mob. And you'll see through that just what Stephen's seeing here. How people can often respond to the truth with rage. Because sin silences truth. Look at verse 57. Look what they did. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at it. This is a picture of how sin silences truth. It screams and shouts down what it doesn't want to hear. It puts its fingers in his ears and says, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. You ever see have somebody that says, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. That's what they're doing here. That's the picture you have. And what you see is how this peaceful tribunal suddenly angrily attacks Stephen. And what's amazing about this is they're supposed to be a loving, peaceful tribunal. They're supposed to be the good guys who are hearing the case. But what do they do? They suddenly turn into mob mentality. They seek to silence Stephen because they don't want to hear the truth. And that's why they never hear the truth that doesn't just hurt but actually heals. See, that's the danger of putting your fingers in your ears and saying, I can't hear you. It stops you from hearing what you need to hear. That's the danger of not going to worship, not reading your Bible, not being around God's people. It stops you from hearing 
the truth that you need to hear, even when it hurts. The truth that reminds you to keep looking heavenward. See, that's what Stephen's showing here. It's what he's laying out before them. And what you see here is how they get so angry that they don't hear the truth, that they suddenly become like this mob of the late 1600 Salem witch trials. They got their pitchforks out ready to burn Stephen at the stake as were. All because they're silencing the truth. And it's just what you see Stephen experiencing. Look what it says in verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They see Stephen's truth as some unclean, blasphemous words that they didn't need to just get rid of, get outside and away from the temple area. And you see their mob mentality by what they do. How they rush at him, throw him out of the city, and stone him. You know why that's mob mentality? Because they had no lawful authority to stone him. Just think back to Jesus Christ's own trial. Pilate says to the Jews, why don't you guys just stone Jesus? What do they say? John 18, 31. The Jews tell Pilate, it's not lawful for us to put, listen to this word, anyone to death. Suddenly that's out the window, though. They hear this truth that hurts. They don't want to hear it. So what do they do? They forget what the law says, and they can't put anyone to death. And they go ahead and they stone Stephen because they're letting sin silence the truth. Stephen's shown them how their history is one of idolatry, one of chasing after foreign deities, not turning to Christ and trusting in him as the true temple. And what do they do? How do they prove that Stephen's wrong? By confirming his very words by acting unlawfully, doing what the law says they can't do. They're showing Stephen how they're law-abiding citizens by violating the law. You get that? Isn't that really wise what they're doing here? Showing, hey, Stephen, you're wrong, and we're going to prove it by violating the law and killing you. And you see what this is, how when you silence sin, when sin silences the truth, you sink into madness. Their actions here are illegal, brutal, and undignified. And it's much like you see in America today, when people are actually encouraged to shout down and physically assault and attack anybody who disagrees with them. That doesn't allow for open dialogue. That doesn't allow for hearing the truth fully, does it? You need to be willing to hear the whole truth. And what do they do? They lay their coats at one who agrees with them. That's what happens today. The power elite say, lay your coats at our feet. We'll support you. And that's just what you see going on our text here with Saul. Verse 58 ends. And the witnesses lay down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. This verse is easy to pass over. Kind of just let it go by without even thinking about it much. But it shows you something critical. It shows you how intimately involved Saul of Tarsus was with Stephen's death and crucifixion. He would play a critical part in Stephen's unlawful stone. He was a trusted co-conspirator who aided this angry mob by watching their clothing. See, what you need to understand about stoning is, stoning is hard work. You got these big bulky robes on, you gotta take them off, you gotta strip down to the waist. And you know how long it takes to stone somebody to death? How many stones you have to hit them with and pound them with before they die? So what that meant was, while you were engaged in this process, you needed a trusted co-conspirator to watch your clothing. Think about going to the beach or the lake and you wanna go in the water. Who do you get to watch your clothes, your cell phone, your wallet? Just some stranger passing by? No, somebody you trust. Somebody who can count on not to run off with it. Well, that's the picture you have of Saul, who, as you know, is the Apostle Paul. And what's so amazing about this, Saul of Tarsus, that they chose to be their co-conspirator, is he's the same one that God chose to be one of his greatest instruments. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good to hear? See, that's where you find your hope and your comfort with all your unsaved relatives. Because it tells you that God can take even a mob murderer like Saul and turn him into one of his most trusted treasures. Because that's what God does. He makes Paul one of his greatest servants. And this tells you how God can change even the greatest skeptic's mind, soften the hardest heart, and use sheer evil and turn it for his good. 
So as you've got people attacking and persecuting you, know that through your prayers and through you speaking the truth, God can turn them and change them and use him for his good purposes. Because here's what God does. And you know how you notice? Because he did it with all of you. God took the foolish of the world and made it into his treasured, his prized treasures. You get that? That's what he does with you. He made you one of his prized possessions. And he uses you to go forth and share the truth. So brothers and sisters, let people hear the truth when you speak. And hear the truth now. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. So don't silence this truth, but share it. And do this by showing people what they most need to see, which brings us to our final point. Show them Jesus. There's no doubt in my mind you've heard this phrase, a picture's worth a thousand words. What does that convey? What does that say? That tells you that sometimes one picture can convey more concisely and more effectively than all your mumbled and confusing words that you speak. And this is because while sin can silence the truth, the truth can't be hidden when it's right there before people's eyes. So that's why you want to go forth and not just speak, but to show people Jesus. See, you can speak till you're blue in the face, face and people may not understand you, may not hear you. They might keep their fingers in their ears, plugging it up, not wanting to hear the truth. But think about what happens when you don't just speak to them, but you actually show them who Jesus is and what he did. See, because that's what Stephen does right here. Stephen's in the midst of dying, being put to death by his persecutors, who are unlawfully doing this. And what does he do? Does he curse at them, scream at them, say, I'm going to get you? No. He issues this prayer. And through his prayer, you see how he shows them Jesus. Shows them where his true hope and comfort is found. And you see this because he first calls out to Jesus for deliverance. He's entrusting his heart, his soul, his life, his eternity to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through that, he's showing those who are putting to death a picture of Jesus. Look at verse 59. Look what it says. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. These words not only show you where Stephen's hope was, but it also shows you how he was showing this tribunal and all who were there a clear picture of Jesus. And you see this clearly when you come to understand that the words that Stephen speaks are virtually identical to the words that Jesus Christ himself spoke as he was dying on the cross. Stephen's doing just as he sees Jesus do. You want to know how you show people Jesus? Then go and do as Jesus does. That's what Stephen's doing here. Think about Luke 23, 46. Speaking of Jesus' crucifixion, here's what it says. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. <clears throat> Stephen showing them Jesus by dying with the same words on his lips. But that's not all. It gets even better because he's got more showing to do. So he shows them more of Jesus. And how does he do it? By exhibiting Christ-like grace before his persecutors. Stephen's being wrongly accused People have come and lied about him. False witnesses have raised up, and now they're unlawfully putting him to death. And yet he never curses, never screams out, never says, I'm going to get you. But instead, what does he do? He shows them Jesus by praying. Look at verse 60. Look what it says. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Right here what you're seeing is how Stephen shows them Jesus by doing just like Jesus did and praying for his persecutors. In Luke 23, 34, as Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross dying, what does he cry out? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen is on death's doorstep, 
And what does he do? He doesn't look at himself, his pain, his demise. But rather, he looks at his persecutors with compassion, just like Jesus Christ does. And he says, they know not what they do. They're lost in their sin. They don't understand. They need my prayers. So Stephen prays for them just like Christ did. And he does this because he's looking heavenward and seeing Christ. And when you do that, when you see what Christ has done for you, you know what that does? That gives you a different perspective, even of your enemies and your persecutors. And so you see Stephen right here serving as the first Christian martyr. Now, why is that significant? Because in Greek, the word martyr means witness. And think about what Christ told way back in 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So here Stephen is in his death, and he's serving as a witness of Jesus Christ. And how's he doing it? By doing just like Jesus and praying for his enemies, praying for his persecutors, praying for those who are killing him. The very people who are putting to death, he's praying for their salvation and their souls. So let me ask you, do you do the same thing with your enemies? That guy that bugs you at work, that neighbor you just can't stand, do you find time to pray that God might bless them, build them up, help them in great ways? Do you say, God, show me how I might help them and share the word with them? See, I think the truth is, most of us, when we're being persecuted and offended, we pray for deliverance from our persecutors. We like suddenly imprecatory prayers at that point in time. But what should we be doing? We should be showing them Jesus, just as Stephen does, by praying for them. See, that's what Stephen does. He's looking like Jesus by praying the same words. And listen, this is not natural. It's not easy to do. But you know how it makes it so much easier? When you're looking heavenward and you're being reminded of Christ's promises and you come to understand that death isn't the end. Look at how our text ends. Look at verse 16. And when he said this, he fell asleep. See, this language fell asleep. It's reminding us that death is coming to us all, but death does not have the last say. For those looking to Jesus Christ for their salvation, your death is just one stop on the path to your glorious homecoming. Do you realize that? If you have that eternal perspective in your mind, now you can truly pray for those who persecute you. Now you can truly go forth and look like Jesus Christ. Think of it this way. Think of when you're dead tired. Do you know when you're just exhausted? You always just fall into your bed and pass out? What happens in the morning, though? You wake up refreshed and renewed, facing a whole new day. Well, for the Christian who knows Jesus Christ, when you die, guess what happens? You wake up to a brand new, glorious, eternal day the rest of your life. That's exciting, people. That's what you're looking for. That's how you can pray for your persecutors. Because that's what you're looking at when you look heavenward. That's what you see. Christ standing there saying, welcome home, and wrapping his arms around you. Isn't that good news? Isn't that truth worth sharing? Isn't that a truth that doesn't just hurt but actually heals? Can you go forth and show people Jesus by not just saying it but actually living this way? When someone offends you, when they cut you off on the road, buy them a donut. Don't curse at them. Do something nice for them. That shows them Jesus. See, you can do this if you're praying and you know that Christ is there with you. And you've got the spirit that indwells you and empowers you. And what that means is you can do this when things go well. And you can do it on your worst days. And you can do it even on your last day. As you're about to breathe your last breath, you can show people Jesus. So brothers and sisters, whatever your circumstances, whatever turmoil, heartache, hardships you're facing today, show everyone around you Jesus. Dying with dignity isn't taking your own life. It's being willing to lay down your life for the sake of another. It's doing just what you see Jesus Christ do on the cross. When he went to the cross, not for his sin, but for yours. Dying as the perfect atoning sacrifice for you. Being willing to lay his life down so you might live. And doing this despite the fact that he had no sin. You realize that? 
Your sin is what he was willing to die for. So what does Christ do as he's there on the cross? He's looking heaven and trusting his spirit into his Father's hands and praying for his persecutors. And what do we see Stephen doing? The exact same thing, because he's showing everybody Jesus. So let me ask you, how about you? Are you willing to lay your life down? Are you willing to lay down your time, your talents, and treasures so somebody else might hear the truth and be brought to saving life? Be turned from death to life? Understand this. When you do that, people see Jesus. And people need to see Jesus. And here's why. Because people all around you are dying. So what are you going to tell them? Are you going to tell them there's no shame in giving up? There's no shame in giving up all hope? Or are you going to give them a different message? Are you going to show them Jesus? Are you going to show them how he laid down his life even for them in the midst of their pain and turmoil? Will you actually give them hope by turning and pointing to Jesus Christ, turning their attention heavenward? If you truly want to help people die with dignity, then what you want to do is show them Christ. Show them how Jesus Christ died for their sins, but how he didn't stay dead, how he rose from the grave, rose to secure their salvation and bring them eternal life. Tell them this. Tell them that Jesus Christ is the Savior they need. And if they don't want to hear it, if they got their fingers in their ears, then show them. Show them Jesus by doing like Jesus would do. Laying down your life for them. Are you willing to do that for another? Are you willing to do that for your loved ones? How about for those you don't care so much for? How about those I dare to say you actually hate? Are you willing to lay down your life so they might see Jesus and be brought to save life? See, that's what you want to do. Show them Jesus Christ on the cross and paint for them a picture of what it truly looks like to be one dying with dignity. Do this, because dying with dignity means showing people Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture you give us. We thank you, Lord, that through this we get to see that while the truth hurts, if we listen to it, we can find how it heals. So, Lord, help us to truly go forth as your servants who show forth Christ in all circumstances and all contexts. Use us, Lord, to turn people to your son. And, Lord, I ask that there's any here this morning that knows you not, use these preached words to do a mighty work in their hearts, to bring them to save For we ask these things in Jesus Christ, in his precious name. Amen.